a keynote speaker, um, Irene Muffy. She's a social anthropologist and a professor at the University of uh, Lausanne. Um, she's a specialist of the Arab world. Um, and she has conducted a lot of great research on reproductive uh, justice, among other things, um, uh, in uh, the Arab world, especially Jordan and Tunisia. And one of her latest books uh, uh, is from uh, post-revolutionary uh, Tunisia on abortion, uh, politics, medicine, and morality. And she, she has also been an associated researcher at CMI, so we feel like we have some claims to her. <laughs> um, so the, the title of our keynote is uh, Reproductive Justice and Democracy. Well, and not really. But... <laughs> not really. No. The title has changed since the program. Yes. Uh, and then you have about 30 uh, minutes. So the, the whole session is on, on reproductive justice. So, sorry. So good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you to Siri Live and uh, the Bergen Exchanges for inviting me. It's uh, I'm. It's a really a pleasure to be here again uh, after a few years of absence, and uh, I'm really excited to be here. So um, my idea with this um, uh, talk of about thirty minutes. Uh, is uh, to uh, situate, uh, try to situate the concept of uh, reproductive justice, uh, identify its links uh, with maybe other notions that circulate and, uh, and related to the same um, uh, meanings, and uh, reflect also on its uh, possible applications, of course, uh, in a very non-exhaustive uh, manner. Uh, and so be before speaking about the notion of uh, reproductive justice, I think it is important to mention the fact that this term is not accepted uh, everywhere and that it circulates together so with other terms which were introduced earlier in the, let's say, in the, in the, in the discourse of uh, international organizations. So I would say that there is a kind of a galaxy of terms and concepts that are tied to specific historical periods and specific groups of actors that uh, partly overlap and that continue to be uh, used uh, in, at the national level or, and at the international level. So these notions, particularly the, the notions I would like to talk about uh, today are that of sexual and reproductive health, um, that of uh, sec sexual and reproductive rights, and also that of gynecological and obstetric violence that are also terms that are much used uh, not only by scholars, but also by activists. Sorry, so, so very shortly, I want to recall that the notion of reproductive and sexual health emerged in the 1970s and was internationally consecrated at the International Conference of Population and Development organized by the United Nations uh, that took place in Cairo in 1994. And I'm sure you are all familiar with uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, meeting. The notions of sexual and reproductive rights were developed uh, in the following years, merging the notions of human rights and that of sexual and reproductive health and there were many actors involved uh, in the, <clears throat> let's say, in the introduction of these notions, uh, feminists and uh, transnational groups uh, and organizations, uh, physicians, officers of uh, the UN, uh, religious leaders, uh, states, so were the main actors of the, this international arena uh, in which these notions were elaborated, uh, discussed, circulated, and sometimes, of course, there were conflicts uh, around, uh, around them. So I, I will give maybe some more details on the emergence of sexual and obstetric violence in, in a few minutes. So what I want to do so with you, as I told you, is uh, to explore so some roots in this galaxy. And I will give you so a few elements that are far from being exhaustive to introduce the discussions that will follow during uh, the round uh, table. And so uh, I will start with the... Um, Works? Yes, with a quotation from a recent article by uh, Vanya Smith-Oka and colleagues 
uh, this uh, is when violence happens in obstetric contexts, then it not, not only perpetuates gender inequality, it also contributes to and is evidence of the, its normalization. This is just how things are done. So now for around eight years, let's say since 2015, at least the terms obstetric violence and less frequently gynecological uh, violence have occupied the European media and uh, reached the institutions of the European states and the European Union. Whereas already during 19, the 1970s and 1980s, feminist activists and scholars uh, in countries uh, such as uh, uh, North America and Europe in particular, denounced the phenomena sexual and obstetric violence designates. These last terms are new and come from Latin America. It was indeed from the southern uh, countries of the American continent that the term obstetric violence spread to North America and Europe. In several South American countries, the fight for sexual and reproductive rights began in the 1970s and 1980s. Attention was paid to violence in family planning programs, for example, and violence against women in medical, in medical services in Peru, for example, Costa Rica and Brazil. So there are several studies uh, about these countries. Discrimination against Amerindian populations in Peru, Argentina, and Mexico has been the subject of studies and public denunciations. Alongside the Cairo Conference of Population and Development in 1994 and the World Conference uh, on Women in Mexico City in 1975 and Beijing 1995, a pivotal moment in the recognition of women's rights in the field of reproductive health was the Conference on the Humanization of Childbirth in Fortaleza, uh, Brazil, which took place in uh, 2000. Uh, this conference saw the creation of a group called the La Carupan, Latin American and Caribbean Network for the Humanization of Childbirth, which urged member states to take measure, measures to ensure respect for women's human rights in the field of reproductive health. In 2004, for example, Argentina passed a law on the humanization of childbirth. The law led to enactment uh, in 1909 of another law on gender <coughs> violence, which defines obstetric violence. And however, as you probably know, the first country to define obstetric violence precisely in law was Venezuela in 2007, followed by several other countries in the continent. So I will not read the, the, the definition, but this was so one of the first definitions related specifically to the medical uh, uh, field, so to, to the medical setting of uh, obstetric uh, violence. So this definition, which is mainly related to the definition of a humanized word, and on the other side, denounces uh, the over-medicalization of childbirth in many uh, countries, is found in most laws uh, uh, enacted in South American countries in the 2010s, with differences, uh, of course, in penalties. So there are lighter administrative penalties in some countries, uh, <clears throat> criminal penalties, including prison in others, although enforcement uh, of these laws is non-existent or very difficult according to the liter literature I could uh, read. So Argentina's Humanized Birth Act defines humanized birth so also in a similar way. Sorry, it's, uh, it's just uh, a, a part of, of, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, definition. And again, if you read through this uh, definition, uh, it is very much related to the paradigm of uh, um, uh, uh, humanized birth as defined in Fortaleza in 2000 uh, at this conference I mentioned, and also related to uh, over-medicalization of, of birth and uh, uh, so all the acts that happen uh, during a hospital birth uh, and not uh, in other kind of um, settings. So the context of uh, this definition contrasts sharply with what happens in the maternity wards of many countries, including the United States. And I chose uh, the United States as an example because 
first of all, is one of the more expensive health system in the world. Uh, so it, it maybe we could think that uh, it would be one of the best because more, more money are uh, invested in it. And also because if we think about um, the, the American Association of Gynecologists and Obstetricians, it is considered a kind of reference for uh, uh, many other associations in the world. So as a model uh, proposing so norms that should be uh, very often adopted also in other countries. And uh, uh, a recent and detailed article by North American uh, uh, legal scholar Elizabeth Kukura, an article uh, published in 2018, draws a very sad picture of obstetric violence in the United States, uh, which affects the life of all women, but particularly women of color and foreign women not mastering English. She examined several cases that took place in the USA, uncovering what she prefers to call uh, abuse, coercion, and disrespect, uh, rather than uh, obstetric violence. These are conducts healthcare providers can adopt towards pregnant and birthing women, and that cause what she calls objectionable, traumatic, or harmful, harmful effects. Abuse, coercion, and disrespect can take place separately, but very often overlap. Their degree can also vary or, uh, and be identified differently according to the person who perform or experience them and the medical context. So this is one of the main problems, and for those of you who work on these topics, it's, it's clear, uh, one of the main problems which the term obstetric violence um, uh, reveals that it is very complicated to find a, a, a universal definition, a definition which will fit in all contexts and which will be a transcultural uh, uh, definition because norms and perceptions uh, about violence in general or obstetric violence in particular can vary uh, from a social cultural context uh, uh, to another. So in the category of abuse, uh, Kukura classifies forced surgeries such as caesareans and episiotomies she emphasized what, and I quote her, uh, what she says is that when performed without a woman's consent, both cesarean surgery and episiotomy constitute direct violation of the body, compounding the potential for severe physical and emotional injury, end of quote. In the category of abuse, it is possible to include all medical unconsented procedures, such as the induction or acceleration of labor, manual removal of the placenta, a vacuum or forceps assisted deliveries. Sexual assaults during childbirth are also abuse, uh, classified as abuse. Examples of them are unnecessary vaginal exams or what is called the husband's stitch, which was uh, very much debated, for example, in France in the recent years. The husband's stitch is a surgical procedure some doctors, when su uh, suturing an episiotomy, add an extra stitch to tighten the woman's vagina to create more sexual pressure for the male partner, or supposed to create more sexual pleasure. In the category of coercion, uh, Kukura includes first uh, of all court order caesareans, which happen when a doctor or hospital administrator and I quote her, seek judicial intervention to compel the woman to submit to surgery, end of quote. This goes against the fundamental right of every individual to her physical or his physical integrity. However, several courts have ordered cesareans in the name of fetal health and well-being in the United States. Whereas some courts more recently have refused to make decisions in these cases, Others have not and continue in, uh, to order cesarean sections if a woman refuses it against the physician's advice. And I will quote, uh, because I think it's very significant, an example Kukra makes in her article. So she, she writes, in 1996, Laura Pemberton decided to deliver at home after she was unable to find a local obstetrician who would attend her VBAC. So it's a vaginal birth after cesarean which is actually today recommended. After laboring for a day with no signs of complications, 
She was worried about dehydration and decided to visit the hospital to receive IV, IVF fluids before returning home. Medical staff refused to provide fluids unless the, she consented to a cesarean. When Pemberton learned that the hospital intended to seek a court order, she snuck down the back stairs of the hospital in her bare feet and went home to continue laboring. Subsequently, the sheriff and state attorney removed her from her home, strapping her legs together on a stretcher to at attend a hearing at the hospital. The judge ordered the cesarean, even though Pemberton could feel the fetus progressing into her birth canal without complication. A federal district court later rejected Pemberton's claims of negligence, false imprisonment, a violation of her constitutional rights. So end of quote. Uh, another main form of coercion in the US system is when healthcare providers threaten burden of pregnant women with legal intervention by child welfare authorities to obtain women's consent to treatment. So an investigation into whether a parent has abused or neglected a child subjects to entire uh, family to state surveillance and may trigger scrutiny of other aspects of their uh, private lives, including housing, family relationships, and nutrition. Such scrutiny may lead to the removal of children from their families and termination of parental rights. So Kukra narrates the cases of several women who were deprived of their parental rights because they had received, refused medical interventions, although the children were born healthy. Kukra stresses, the poor and young women, uh, stresses that poor and young women who already live under increased state surveillance might more than other categories of women being afraid to refuse medical interventions when providers threaten them to alert the child wealth, welfare authorities. So I have, of course, no time to go into more details that I believe that Kukura's article, but I believe that Kukura's article is a significant contribution to understand what ordinary obstetric violence means uh, in the United States. And another important recent contribution uh, is the article by uh, a number of authors, among which uh, Robbie Davis Floyd, who is a very well-known anthropologist working in the domain of reproductive uh, health, uh, and this article explains how mo most uh, routine practices in a uh, U.S. hospital at, are actually iatrogenetic. And uh, so they, they cause this uh, spectrum of unintentional harm, as it is uh, written, disrespect, violence, and abuse uh, in the title of the article. So what about reproductive justice and injustice? So the notions of obstetric and gynecological violence are usually confined to the medical field, to the relationship of uh, women or couples. gender-based and link, is linked to the very fact that pregnant and birthing women are women and as such subordinated to the local gender regime, but can also be intertwined and reinforced by their ethnic origin, sexual orientation, social background, age, or marital status, for example. For this reason, some authors, uh, some scholars, prefer to use the term uh, obstetric injustice or reproductive injustice, considering the set of inequalities and discriminations to be better described within the framework of the notion of reproductive justice. Indeed, the concept of reproductive justice provides a broader view of the violence suffered by women and takes account of the differences in women's therapeutic itineraries according to their characteristics, so class, race, age, etc. So I will now give some elements uh, to situate, better situate this notion. Uh, the latest arrival in the language of international organizations, activists, and social science researchers 
the term reproductive justice is intended to be more inclusive and more appropriate than the notion of sexual and reproductive rights, although the issue uh, is open to debate and shall be considered in each local context. The notion of reproductive uh, justice was developed by feminist organizations in the global south, Asian communities for reproductive justice in particular, and by associations of Afro-American women <clears throat> in the United States, particularly Sister Song Women of Color Reproductive Health Collective. Um, I want to recall that <clears throat> between the end of 1980s and the beginning of the 1990s, a transnational feminist movement was formed, which was able to express itself very clearly at the Cairo Population Conference and the Beijing Women's Conference in 1995. Women from the Global South and racialized women from the North were able to make their voices heard and to criticize the point of view of white and often privileged feminists by bringing in other demands, other points of view, and, view, uh, and that did not coincide with those of white feminists from the global north, or not necessary, or not always. So the notion of reproductive justice, and I quote uh, the Sister Song Collective, concerns the living conditions of women in their communities, and of quote, conditions which are the basis for the possibility of exercising their rights. The definition of reproductive justice is therefore intended to be critical of the notion of individual choice or individual access that has been the hobby horse of white feminist movements in northern countries, movements led mainly by middle class women. So in the United States in particular, these movements have fought for the right to abortion without including the rights of racialized women or women of color not to be subjected to forced sterilization, for example, or to be placed in conditions which they do not have the means to bring up their children. And so I, um, according to the North American feminist sociologist Dorothy Roberts, and I will quote her, uh, the neoliberal notion of reproductive choice is consistent with the neoliberal market logic that relies on individuals acquiring goods to manage their health, whereas the state should invest in public health and provide for the other social needs of the wider public. So reproductive justice defined in the reproductive justice briefing book as follows. Reproductive justice is the complete physical, mental, spiritual, political, social, and economic well-being of women and girls based on the full achievement and protection of women's human rights. This definition as outlined by Asian communities for reproductive justice offers a new perspective on reproductive issues advocacy um, pointing out uh, that for indigenous women and women of color, it is important to fight equally for, these are the main, three main points, the right to have a child, the right not to have a child, and the right to parent the children we have, as well as to control our birthing options, such as midwifery. We also fight for the necessary enabled conditions to realize these rights. This is in contrast to the senior focus on abortion but the pro-choice movement that excludes other social justice movements. So the notion of reproductive justice goes beyond the individual to include the social reality of inequality, and I quote again this same book, more particularly inequality in the possibility of controlling one's own reproductive destiny, end of quote. The notion of reproductive justice is therefore much broader than that of sexual and reproductive rights as individual rights, because it includes the material conditions that make it possible for a person to make free decisions. It is up to governments to guarantee these conditions and ensure that women can fully enjoy their rights. These elements were not absent from the discussions that feminists from the North and South had in the mid 1990s around the Cairo Conference of Population and Development which marked a turning point in the history of women's rights more broadly, but were not uh, as far, I mean, uh, discussed as far as uh, in the, during this discussion about um, uh, reproductive justice. So among the fundamental points underlined by the Sister Song Collective is the issue of not separating the right to abortion from other rights 
concerning uh, so economic justice, the environment, so we talked already about that, racialized people, migrants, people with disabilities, and people discriminated against on the basis of sexual orientation. So the focus is therefore shifting to what they call reproductive oppression. The control and exploitation of women and girls and other individuals through our bodies, sexuality, labor, and reproduction, rather than a narrow focus on the right to abortion. So to sum up, uh, in the social sciences and among activists, obstetric and the gynecological violence is conceived of as a manifestation in the medical field of the wider violence that women, because they are women, suffer in the society to which they belong and not as a phenomenon in itself. As some, uh, as some scholars have pointed out, it is very important uh, to, and I, I quote uh, uh, a sentence from this article, it is very important to distinguish obstetric violence specifically from other forms of medical violence, recognizing the difference between abuse of women in childbirth and more general abuse of passions. So of course we might, might uh, recall uh, the notion of also of um, uh, medical races or obstetric races is if it is in the domain of sex. So there are other forms of violence based on class, race, etc. It should, it should also be remembered that it is not the sex of professionals that is determining factor in gender abuse uh, of women, but their membership of a profession and medical knowledge that is androcentric and based on inequalities between women and men. And of course, there are many works that have shown this uh, aspect. So should we uh, prioritize the notion of reproductive justice over that of sexual and reproductive rights? On the one hand, some researchers and intellectuals have criticized the notion of human rights for being moralistic, new colonial, and implying a new liberal conception of the subject. Despite their universal claim the local context in which sexual and reproductive rights are understood and implemented have different characteristics that modify the way they are interpreted and applied by local actors. What is retained and considered important in each context varies, as does the way in which human rights are translated by states and non-state actors. On the other hand, there are researchers and activists who see sexual and reproductive rights as covering too narrow a field, which, leaving aside the wider socioeconomic and legal context, cannot give rise to real respect for individuals in the field of sexuality and reproduction. For these researchers and activists, the concept of reproductive justice is more appropriate than that of sexual and reproductive rights for a number of reasons. So reproductive justice, as we have said, refers to um, contexts that enable women and men to make reproductive choices and decisions about their health that are consistent with their wishes and derived from knowledge of existing possibilities. So while rights that take their meaning and value from the legal realm, justice is broader notion that touches on the morality of individuals and communities and challenges inequalities of power. So, and I, and I quote, uh, this is a quotation by, uh, from an article by uh, Maya Unitan and Stacey Pig of 2014, which is in the, time, the reference, list of references at the end. Um, and so, uh, sorry, because I think I mixed my, uh, my slides. Uh, justice, therefore, includes a moral dimension that rights do not have, their reference being the legal and therefore state or uh, transnational uh, sta uh, state sphere. Justice involves also the issue of access to services and resources, contrary to the con concept of choice, as I already mentioned earlier. Structural conditions must exist to allow individuals to exert their rights to self-determination. So studies carried out in the field uh, in various countries where the concept of sexual and reproductive rights has been introduced showed that the, inter the international context in which they are developed and used is often removed from the way in which the ideas of rights are experienced, incorporated, articulated, and mobilized at the local level. Sorry. <laughs> 
So, and I quote again this article by, by um, uh, sorry, I, I don't know what I did, but uh, I mixed my, sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, th there is a, a, an article by Maya Unitan and, and um, Stacey Pig where they distinguish between what they call rights uh, talk and rights work. So the local implementation of rights uh, rarely correspond to what is called rights talk. So rights talk and the programs put in place locally to make it effective may not produce the desired uh, results, but may have unpredictable and paradoxical effects. And for example, the use of right discourse uh, by conservative forces uh, to criminalize abortion in Latin America, but also, uh, for example, in Tunisia, where I have been working, is uh, an example of this uh, uh, reversal. Uh, so in the name of fetal rights, uh, we uh, so uh, these forces they deny uh, women's rights, uh, so depriving them to, uh, the, uh, to of the right to control their bodies, to make autonomous reproductive choices, and to benefit from the necessary health services. So what I ask is: Is it possible to translate and apply the notion of reproductive justice in trans transnational perspective? So. Although the notions of sexual and reproductive rights and reproductive justice are uh, the result of collaboration between actors from different regions of the world, their application in different social and political contexts uh, has encountered and may <clears throat> encounter very significant obstacles because it contains cultural presuppositions that are rooted in a history and a conception of the individual and society that are sometimes very different from those of the people who should benefit from them and the states that should implement them. The notions of sexual and reproductive rights as well as that of reproductive justice are cultural constructs resulting from a specific legal, ethical, and historical evolution that requires a cultural translation in each context. This means not only linguistic translation, but also adaptation to specific cultural models and social organizations. So a quick example for my field work, and this is my slide, uh, in Jordan and in Tunisia, where I've been working, the expression, okay, asahal-jinsiya uh, wal-injabiya, which is the translation of uh, sexual and reproductive uh, health, uh, uh, means nothing to health professionals and also and even more uh, to, uh, uh, so to people, to women. Uh, so I've never heard that a uh, health professional mentioned this concept or uh, 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 health, uh, I mean, uh, um, <clears throat> a users, a clinic users mentioned this concept. It is completely exogenous. It doesn't make a any sense. So, um, and uh, I'm sorry, I don't have really the, the time to end my, <laughs> my speech. Uh, I thought it was too long. But I wanted to just mention the, the notion of vernocularization. Uh, uh, so that was used uh, by Peggy Levitt and Sally Murray in an article uh, published in 2009, where uh, they define vernacularization as the process of local appropriation and adoption of global ideas circulating in trans transnational network. So it could be uh, reproductive justice, but also many other uh, concepts. And uh, they note that when global ideas come into contact with the local context, they acquire the ideological and social uh, attributes of that context, but at the same time, retain elements of their original formulation. So they compare what happens during vernacularization to the way in which organic molecules combine uh, with each other. And so the results of this process of vernacularizations are always uh, uh, difficult to predict and, and also can be, as I, I, I already mentioned, uh, paradoxical uh, sometime. And um, so I don't know how to finish because I wanted to give you a few examples of how uh, these notions are difficult actually to apply. I don't know if I can just take one minute. No. <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much. I'm sorry for that. Thank you so much, uh, Irene. I'm sorry I, I couldn't give you more time. I wish I could because it was very interesting and thought provoking. But this session includes not only a keynote, but a book launch and a panel um, with expert comments after that. So 
I just uh, move on uh, to introduce uh, the next speaker, Satang um, Nabame, uh, and she's the director at the, of, of a human rights center at the University of Dakota. And she's also a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Pretoria. And she's our super law transformer <laughs> person who produced, I don't know how many PhDs, uh, but the one PhD that she did produce on one of our projects on political determinants of reproductive health was on choice and uh, conscience from South Africa. And that resulted in a book. And we are very, very happy that you want to use this arena to launch your book. So please, Satan. Good morning, everyone. I know I have about 10 minutes. Um, thank you, um, Liz, and um, this is exciting. Um, I can remember when I first started coming to the bargain exchanges in 2017, um, and where I actually workshopped uh, my PhD proposal. So this is as much of a collective and group work as an individual one. And just for the PhD students uh, in the room, obviously when I workshopped my proposal in 2017, what I wanted to research and what I finally produced was two different things. So, you know, it's it's a process um, anyway. But just to quickly say, I have about 10 minutes and I'm very honored to actually have this opportunity uh, to just give a quick overview um, of the book, uh, which is forthcoming, um, should be out by next month. Um, and um, also to say, obviously, that uh, in the acknowledgement uh, section, uh, the bargain exchanges and the Law Transform Committee obviously is very much well recognized, um, as well as my incredible supervisor, Siri Glopen, um, and Professor Nguena, who really guided me uh, through the process um, as well. So just quickly, so um, my book is Choice and Conscience, Lessons from South Africa, for a global debate. And thank you, Irene, for um, setting up the stage uh, because some of the issues uh, that arise out of the book are very much connected to uh, some of the issues that you raised around reproductive justice, generally around sexual and reproductive rights, uh, but also the gendered nature uh, of medical profession. So to say, obviously, I'm not a doctor, I'm a lawyer by training, but I was very much interested in the intersection between health, um, human rights, uh, gender, and, and so this book is around conscientious uh, of objection, uh, which is also turned out to also be about conscientious commitment um, as well. So in a sense, the book has a, it's a two-part book um, in which really focusing around uh, the exercise of conscientious objection in which healthcare providers based on their personal beliefs, religious, as well as other reasons will do not want to provide um, abortion services. But on the other hand as well, you have healthcare providers that are committed to provide it. So it's a two-part story. I'm not going to read this, but this is just an extract to um, contextualize the issue, especially within the South African case, um, in which you know the interview was um, uh, with a nurse uh, asking about issues around ethics and um, guidance as it relates to the exercise of conscientious objection. And obviously, according to uh, the nurse, she first said, but we are guided by ethics, right? Obviously, there are medical ethics, nursing ethics, as well as others. Um, and but when uh, it, uh, she was asked, uh, "Do you have an ethics committee?" she said, "Not really. Uh, I'm trying to establish committees." So this sort of uh, sets the stage to um, what the context is. And so part of the motivation for the book is obviously um, the book is contextualized in the sense that it's a case study of South Africa. Um, and as we know, uh, 23 years uh, after the enactment on the Choice and Termination of Pregnancy Act, which is considered one of the most liberal abortion laws um, in the world, uh, one of the challenges, obviously, is the lack of clarity around conscientious objection. There is no conscience clause. However, um, uh, through my research, but obviously also existing uh, literature, it shows that there is lack of clarity, especially around what the rights are, but you know, especially as it relates to how um, medical providers uh, should claim such rights, what are the limitations to the rights, as well as who has the right to object, uh, and how the process of making such claims uh, should be regulated um, as well. Uh, just a preview, uh, obviously I'm not going to make this a theoretical conversation, um, but um, so 
it was the PhD itself uh, was um, an LLD. So that meant that I had to still engage in traditional legal scholarship uh, paradigm where I really looked at laws, policies, and it was also comparative in a sense because I drew quite a lot, uh, especially from uh, other jurisprudence uh, and other jurisdictions, especially from Latin America with the Colombian Constitutional Court, as well as other courts that really have progressive um, uh, jurisprudence around that and use uh, those resources as jurisprudential materials, especially in anticipation that ultimately within the South African context, but also beyond, that there will be an opportunity for the courts to actually engage uh, in addressing the issue of consensus objection. Um, I am also an African feminist, uh, and so part of my motivation was to also uh, bring these two sometimes interlink, but sometimes separate walls together. Um, so bridging uh, really the, the traditional legal scholarship paradigm with feminist intellectual traditions as well. Um, I was also very intentional in terms of uh, developing a critical African feminist perspective framework. Part of the motivation was obviously that the issue around consensus objection, not just within the South African context, but uh, in Africa generally, is under theorized and obviously um, um, feminist perspective is also uh, missing uh, in the literature as well. And so part of my motivation was really in terms of drawing obviously uh, from uh, the rich feminist traditions that we have globally, but also contextualizing it within the African context, um, especially using the intersectional framework and some of the um, um, issues uh, that Irene also raised um, as well. So what's the story of the book? So the story of the book is that I was interested in looking at law in action, specifically the choice and termination of Pregnancy Act uh, within South Africa. As I said, obviously, after 23 years, um, the law is really great. Um, uh, however, because there is a lack of clarity as it relates to the exercise of conscientious objection, it provides a rich ground in which healthcare providers are able to exercise this without much regulation. Um, and um, and there is obviously uh, impact as it relates to access to abortion services, even within a liberal uh, system, um, not only a barriers as it relates to consensus objection, but also other challenges as well. The story is also about Africa. Um, and part of my motivation, and this is an addition as well, it, it, a new chapter actually that I added uh, that sort of illustrates um, the recent development, especially the trend towards liberalization of abortion laws in the context, not necessarily that there are new abortion laws per se uh, in Africa, but that there is an expanding uh, grounds uh, for access to abortion. So recently we saw Democratic Republic of Congo, for example, the DRC ratifying the Maputo Protocol, and because they are uh, uh, French uh, monast uh, system, it automatically became law, but we've also seen uh, liberal uh, reforms in Ethiopia, in Mozambique, as well as others. What this book is trying to make a case for is that even though in these countries, perhaps, uh, or within the African context, there is not that much debate around the issue of consensus objection because of the varied nature uh, of the legal system. However, given the increasing trend towards liberalization, it's going to be a conversation. It's going to be part of what um, is going to be a central issue as countries uh, engage uh, within this uh, particular context as well. And so um, this is a drawing that was done during a values clarification uh, workshop. Um, I passed and I did a participant observation as well. It just sort of shows the, the client pathway uh, when folks um, a woman uh, trying to access abortion services. Part of the motivation, obviously, as I said, uh, my interest, especially the empirical focus of the book, is read really around nurses. And when I say nurses, it also include midwives, in a sense, even though I do know that uh, it's distinct profession, in a sense. Um, however, within the Choice and Termination of Pregnancy Act, which is also unique within the South African context, is that nurses who are trained are able to provide abortion services within the first trimester. And so my interest, especially looking at nursing as a gendered practice, was really around focusing on them and how they engage uh, within uh, abortion provision. And so there are um, like uh, different levels of involvement when it comes to nurses, right? So the first one level is that you have nurses who are actually trained to provide abortion services. So they actually do termination of pregnancy services uh, within the first uh, trimester. Um, you also have nurses who are not trained, but who are engaged uh, somehow in, in related services. So taking vital signs, uh, making appointments, booking appointments and doing other stuff. And then you also have other nurses who are general nurses that might not necessarily engage. They might, some of them might give say uh, post-abortion counseling, Others might decide to um, uh, refrain from it. 
part of painting this picture, especially what comes out of the client pathway, is to say that especially as nurses engage in abortion work, it is complex. It is not um, really a clear path um, as, it, as it relates to uh, their engagement as well. Um, so in terms of methodology, as I said, um, it is a uh, social legal research. Uh, so looking at uh, doing the doctrinal analysis, but also uh, empirical uh, work as well. So I was really interested in how nurses translate uh, the abortion law into social practice. So there was a sample of 32 nurses. I think what is really unique about the book is that the nurses uh, are also ones that are, you have nurses that work in public uh, hospitals in South Africa, but I also uh, did interviews and focus group discussion with nurses who actually own their abortion clinic, clinics as well. And that comes with a whole variety uh, of complexities as it relates to how they navigate uh, issues of uh, designation of facilities, but also in terms of access to resources as well. And then I also had interviews with uh, other policymakers and things like that. I think for me, part of, especially as I said, focusing on nursing um, and nurses generally, especially as it relates to their abortion work was in terms of, um, you know, what practice of discretionary power, for in instance, uh, especially as they make decisions regarding whether they provide abortion or not provide abortion and what influences that. And I should have said that I use it, I use the term conscientious objection. Uh, however, within the research itself, it was um, uh, um, the main one of the main findings actually is that most no nurses who are actually refraining from providing abortion services do not actually know what the term conscientious objection is. Um, so that is um, eye opening. I think it's not new, obviously, but I think it's also insightful in terms of how we use you know, conscientious objection, conscientious commitment, and those people that are actually engaged in the practice are not cognizant of what that concept actually uh, means as well. This is just the table of content, and I do have some very nice A3 posters that will be out, so you can have a look at it. Uh, but as I said, the, the book is really a three-part book, right? Um, so one is, I was very much interested, as I said, in the leave experiences of nurses, those that provide abortion uh, uh, services and the challenges that they face, those that do not provide abortion services and the decisions that, um, that, you know, what is the reason for why they do not uh, provide abortion services? And this is just uh, some of the quotes uh, from uh, these nurses that do not provide abortion services. And um, a summary of that is just to say that, uh, especially what I have seen with the objectors, I have about 30 seconds, with the objectors is that uh, you have uh, objectors that are very much like, we are ne there is never a good reason to actually provide abortion services, and I will not do so. However, the majority of the nurses that we actually interview are what we will say situational nurses. So they are willing to provide or not willing to provide abortion, depending on the woman seeking uh, the determination services and, 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 and categorizing them as deserving or undeserving. So if, for example, they experience gender-based violence, like rape, some nurses are like, yes, we are willing to. If it is somebody that is there for repeat abortion, they are less willing to actually provide abortion services generally. And this is the cover of the book. Um, and as I said, it is um, published by the Pretoria University Law Press. It is supposed to be out uh, by the end of this month. Uh, next month, it's going to be um, open access. But there you go. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Satan. Um, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to reading the book. We will have sort of a little bit of a stage um, uh, uh, change here because we need six chairs, not four. Um, um, but we will have an, uh, uh, three uh, panelists uh, commenting on, on both um, Irene's and Satan's uh, 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 presentations. And now I'm really scared because I have to say stuff in Spanish, uh, but <laughs> it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Juliana uh, Cesario Alvin from Federal University of Minas Gerais from Brazil uh, and Francisco, Francisca uh, Pau uh, Ginenes from uh, UNAM, Mexico and Marta Holam from uh, University of Bergen. You're welcome, thank you.
I'm going to yeah. I'll give each of the panelists three, four, three, four minutes. Five. Okay. Five. I hope we will have time for breakfast and for, for some questions afterwards. I'm okay. Okay. One of that? Should I start? Yes. Okay. So uh, first I want to say it's a, a huge honor to be here and I have no words to thank City for inviting me here to, to be with you. So I'm very, very happy uh, to share, to be part of this conversation. My idea is just to say something about the Brazilian context and or things that I believe um, that uh, might help us think not only reproductive justice, but also uh, some of the topics we have been discussing like judicialization and autocratization. So uh, I'll, I'll give some, some, some considerations here on this issue, um, starting from the idea that the reproductive rights in Brazil developed uh, much centered in on uh, social and economic rights. So since the redemocratization in the 80s, uh, this was the way uh, through which women's rights and reproductive rights in general developed. So uh, through the right to health and uh, education sometimes, but um, these kind of, of rights. And then in this sense, reproductive rights, especially with a thing of abortion, was always on the side. So during the, the, the constitutional drafting process, this was discussed but didn't make into the constitution. And uh, within the Brazilian Supreme Court, it has be, been always ambiguous. Um, we have legislation that won't allow for abortion in cases of rape, health uh, risk to the to the life of the pregnant person. And we had a, a Supreme Court decision in case of an encephalic fetus. But uh, the Supreme Court always avoided dealing with uh, the issue more directly. And there are some pending cases that, that hasn't been uh, decided. But then uh, we have Bolsonaro and the situation uh, gets much worse. So we had this very incremental little um, development, but with Bolsonaro, we have um, these, these setbacks in terms of gender, but of course, that are connected with other things that we talked about here with uh, neoliberalization. So cuts in terms of, of state expenses and necropolitics uh, related to the extermination of certain populations. So indigenous population, countryside population uh, through different means. So state violence, but also pesticides, um, different ways of exterminating certain populations. And, and then um, women in the middle of that and reproductive rights, you have a, a shift to, for instance, uh, illustrative element is the fact that the, the ministry uh, of or for women uh, be, became to, to be called uh, women and family under Bolsonaro. And that, and that I think uh, exemplifies how, how the approach changed. And, um, and, but the thing is Bolsonaro didn't manage to change the law because the law is, was already bad enough in terms of reproductive rights and abortion. <laughs> But uh, uh, he managed to, to, to worsen the situation in other ways. So I think Lisa mentioned on Monday the bureaucratic lawfare, lawfare regarding academic freedom. So this, this uh, is one element, the perse uh, persecution of healthcare professionals, but also journalists that would cover these topics. We have other barriers to, to abortion. There is underfunding of the services in case of legal abortion. We have... Um, the imposition of anti-scientific and illegal measures like the need for a judicial orders that are not required by law, this kind of thing. Uh, and uh, reflecting on certain considerations, conscientious objection doesn't seem to be uh, a big problem for us because we didn't get there. So we didn't have, we didn't have the changes that would uh, shift this debate to a, to a legal debate. It's well, the, the law is, is bad and, and it's just uh, being applied in an even worse way. So, so the practice creates these this barriers. We have the problem of confidentiality between patients and doctors, stigma and all that. And that uh, led us in the, in the last um, two years to very emblematic cases of um, pregnant uh, girls around the country that became very famous uh, because, because they are very tragic, but they symbolize uh, all the layers of violations of rights that are involved in these cases. So 
these or nine, 10, 11 years old girls that were subjected to uh, systematic uh, rape and, and uh, abuse within their families. Sometimes they get pregnant, they go to the hospital. When they go, when they are supported, they when they know how to go to the hospital, when they have some support to do so, they go there, they don't get uh, the abortion because of these different reasons. Sometimes they even reach uh, judiciary power. In the judiciary power, they are re-victimized. And we have these uh, accounts of judges trying to convince the girls that they shouldn't uh, get an abortion despite the fact that they have the right to do so. And uh, and this and these cases, I believe, they exemplify what uh, Irene was saying, um, or or at least they require the, the framework that Irene was proposing because they involve uh, many uh, strict structural elements. These girls uh, are girls from uh, peripheral parts of the country. They are racialized girls, so there are ele many elements here that uh, that I believe that um, that require this more holistic, complex. Uh, framework to be um, understood. And one last remark would be um, on the role not only of the state, but uh, of, um, of society in general. And we are talking about um, healthcare professionals. And I think this is something important is was how the, 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 the medical associations were captured by this Bolsonaristic uh, uh, mindset and, uh, and helped to, to enforce these illegal or infralegal, illegal and infralegal measures that made it even harder to have access to this kind of service. So I think this is a, an element that helps to, 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 uh, to complete this, this broader picture of the situation uh, in Brazil. Thank you so much. Quickly moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I think uh, both Irene and Satang uh, help us to see how much work we still have to do to, to densificate you know, women's autonomy. It's only recently that these issues entered, as Juliana was saying, the domain of human rights, and it's not a perfect frame, as you explained. Uh, and uh, we now are more aware than, than, than before that if we don't combine this with requirements of substantial equality, with you know a wider view on the on the factors that operate upon people in the wider society, we won't be getting very, very far away. And the process, I mean, has been going on for decades, uh, thanks to immense efforts of mobilization, but it advances so slowly that I think we require an explanation on why this is going so slow. So there are, I think, many reasons, but I, in these remarks, I wanted to underline two. One, Again, as a lawyer, what I see every every day is that, of course, we are trying we are trying to evolve a constitutional and a legal matrix that was, you know, designed <laughs> upside down. That that was, you know, the first constitutions were written by men, and and none of these concerns entered the realm of the constitutional or what was important. You know, only public life was really dealt with, and public life was the life of the men, and so the only things you you were you would see there was vote, assembly, speech, the things that were important to men. And we are trying to evolve these frameworks. This is a uh, uh, Ruth Rubio Marin was here, so I'm sure she has articulated greatly this argument. So you know the the the, the things we are trying to change are so biased from the beginning that obviously the process is very slow. Um, and and not only for women, but also for the LGBT plus reproductive agenda. You know, now, now only now we start to see rulings that think that talk about women and, and and pregnant persons. You know, like after many. So that's one reason. The other reason uh, is, of course, as Satang illustrates, because every step forward is met with episodes of backlash. Every single one. Sometimes these episodes neutralize all the advancement, and sometimes they they don't. And it's a kind of zigzag, no? And I think I want to compliment on Latin America a little bit. Uh, as we saw in a book that uh, Juliana and me have been involved in a group project about constitutionalism and gender in Latin America. In Latin America, the tendency now, uh, despite the small advances in Brazil, it's, it's contrary to the United States. I mean, the, the, there has been significant progress in the last, in the last decades. And um, well, at now, for instance, courts do speak about obstetric violence, some, some courts in the region. And of course, abortion, which has been the great battle in the region, has advanced. I mean, the situation in, in Central America 
uh, is uh, in some other countries is still bad. Uh, but you know we have now um, a, 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 a limit, a, a trimester, not a trimester kind of thing, but early abortion legalized in Argentina, Colombia, Cuba, French Guyana, Guyana, Mexico, and Uruguay. Which is which is in this in this very interesting thing about uncertainty uh, and and how consensus objection is you know uh, some people just invoke it because they are not sure about you have ambiguity in both cases but definitely a, a temporal thing is better because because otherwise with the indications traditional model the the medical personnel is very scared of being criminalized as a accomplice so I think there's some progress. Uh, uh, with this thing, but but of course we also have in Latin America we also have backlash. And ah, sorry, and I wanted to mention that in Latin America, of course, two very important factors explain the progress, which is the Inter-American Court, because you know, like uh, uh, Artavia Murillo, which was an in vitro fertilization case, it was perfect. It was not an abortion case, but it put the premises that you know that the protection of life starts with implantation and not with, not with the union of the gametes, that the fetus is not a person and that the protection of the fetus is okay, but it can never unbalance the due protection of the... So this was very important. And now the Inter-American Court will have the Beatriz case coming out, which is also a perfect case because it is very extreme from El Salvador and this will be an abortion case. And the other thing that explains also the progress is the green tide, which is this kind of solidarity at the regional level. But of course, we also have backlash. Uh, and the backlash is juridified, as no, as Rachel Cedar would see, no, your next book, Rachel, will be the juridification of backlash. Because it's <laughs> it's just what, what we have been discussing. It's just adapting the, the 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 lingua franca of the day, which is of course legal. And and consentious objection is a very important uh, space for backlash. But not the only one. I wanted to to mention as well, of course, education. I think we will have a panel on 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 these questions. Medical education and medical curriculum. I I I can't understand why this is this is like a kind of isolated of human rights and everything. You know, these me medical schools that are still very much controlled by uh, Catholicism in, in, in Opus Dei, etc. I mean, the, the the law should really like go into that. Uh, economic liberties remember the you know the the founding the right to found confessional schools so the the the, the cakes in the case of lgbt you know the economic freedoms have been also used um so uh, and the efforts to change the composition of the judiciary and, or, and of human rights bodies so um so again i i think this is very helpful in in seeing what are the challenges which again at the global level are pretty similar and, and I think as the backlash is now very juridified, then not, on the one hand, we must play with the, the law, you know, uh, maybe can like impact on many of the detailed access things that are so powerful in denying access. And the other thing is just doing better arguments in terms of consensus objection. On, on a legal basis, this is an abuse of the right. I mean, you cannot, you know, you cannot sustain consensus objection in the way, for instance, the Chileans have, have put uh, uh, institutional consent of objection, which is against all our theories about the, the rights of legal persons, you know, of artificial persons. I mean, there's a lot of legal work to be done in the details mm -hmm. to counter the backlash also from the legal. And I, yeah. I'm <laughs> sorry, thank you so much. And I'm sorry for the limited time that we have. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you for allowing me to come here today and listen to these very interesting presentations. I really look forward to reading the book. Um, I'm going to try to comment on this from, from a Norwegian perspective. Um, first, let me say that uh, I'm very happy for this uh, thorough presentation of, um, of reproductive justice, and it made me reflect and think about how that what that entails, how we, how we can take this broader broader perspective on reproduction and, and try to think about what that does also in a Norwegian context. Um, first of all, it reminds me of this um, this uh, term from the 90s in, in anthropology of reproduction of stratified reproduction, which really encourages us to think about who, how do we design this society in a way that allows or encourages some groups of people to have children and disencourages other groups of people to have children. And I think that 
that is a useful tool to think, and that's something I really like about using the term of reproductive justice uh, as compared to sexual reproductive health, because it 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 paints a broader picture about all of society and not just the health related uh, aspects of it. And then as I was thinking now about how how to kind of take this into the Norwegian context, I'm very happy that uh, that the backlash was brought in, 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 and especially so backlash in terms of conscientious objection, because in the Norwegian context, we've had a, a sort of opposite situation, which can be nice to think about that backlash works both ways. Uh, because some 10 years ago, eight to 10 years ago, uh, for the first time in over 40 years, since Norway had its, um, its uh, abortion law that has abortion on demand until week 12, uh, the Christian Democratic Party was in government and then they tried to, to increase um, medical professionals' rights to conscientious objection within the frame legal framework. But that led to a, a backlash in the sense that all of a sudden we were discussing the abortion law again. Uh, there was so much protest around that issue. The women movement really mobilized uh, in a way that they hadn't mobilized in, in many years in Norway. And the result of that process uh, ended up in there is now uh, a committee set down that is revising the current uh, abortion law, likely to suggest a more liberal law than we have today, likely to expand abortion on demand from 12 weeks to we'll, we'll see what they end up suggesting. Uh, so that's one thing being said. And the other thing is then to say, okay, so what happens then for second trimester abortions in Norway? We have this 12 weeks on demand, but then we have from 12 weeks onwards, until the, um, the week 22, which is the latest, uh, or where via the viability criteria comes in in the Norwegian context, uh, is then you meet, you're supposed to meet an, uh, a committee uh, of two medical doctors who then you have to present your case and they evaluate your case and, uh, and you're granted or not granted this uh, second trimester abortion. It should be noted that just about everyone is granted a second trimester abortion, but you still have to go through this uh, through this committee meeting and 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 have your case evaluated. And I think there's also a, a situation in which reproductive justice is very useful uh, as a tool to think with, also within the Norwegian context, much more so than sexual reproductive rights, uh, because it's a situation that that um, favorizes. Uh, resourceful women who are who are um, uh, used to speak up in meetings, who are used to to meet with the uh, authorities, uh, who are um, who who manage well the Norwegian language, and who can uh, stand up for themselves in situations like this. Uh, and it traumatizes; it has a traumatizing effect for for women who are not so confident in in those situations. So I, I just wanted to bring that into this uh, this uh, discussion here that these issues, even though it's it's um, it, it can be easy to think of, of, especially when it comes to abortion, but also other reproductive issues. That if you have the legal arrangement in place, if we have uh, a fairly good abortion law that has, after all, abortion on demand until week twelve, then we're all settled. No, it's not that. That's not the case. We still have these. These terms that are then launched still have their applicability also in, in a context where the situation is respectively or comparatively more uh, favorable than, than other places. But still, if we say that's, that's good enough and we have the law, then, then we are prone to backlash again. So I think that's my, my short comments. Hmm. Yeah. I, do, I, I don't think we actually have time for questions we started by okay okay so some questions am i supposed to pass this around yeah more time will throw it Thank you so much. Um, I'd really like to ask the questions, even though they are not being responded now, because I, because I want the answers later, please. Uh, uh, and this is a question for all of you, but especially for Juliana, who's a lawyer involved in, in some way in the mobilization of the trial that is coming up in the STF about abortion next semester, about um, and trying to connect with the framework that Irene proposed, because this is a, a huge problem in Brazil. If abortion gets legalized, um, 
the scenario is um, racialized mothers, they cannot carry on their children or even have decent conditions to raise them in Brazil already. So there's a concern, a legitimate one, which is, um, will they have the childcare they already are not granted? I mean, they are from the law, but not really in material sense. Um, they will have the conditions uh, to, to be supported and have be be better salaries and wages and, and the taxes that they, are, they have to pay proportionately more in Brazil that also affects um, their children. So th there's this whole bunch of things that needs to be discussed when it comes to maternity and the possibility that you are not um, um, violated in the sense that you are uh, abused by having to have an abortion. Um, so th this would be a question, the sense of how to deal with this challenging if we get abortion legalized, hopefully. And the other question would be for uh, Syntag, if you, if I, I was in doubt, how, for um, why did you put the term client in the pathway uh, illustration if it's it was a choice because uh, women have to pay for abortion or is more in the sense that uh, the way that the system works puts them not just as users as the healthcare system, but as clients. Um, and if this is a specific choice you made to highlight that or it's just because of something else. So that will be my two questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. So everyone, nobody else wants to ask anything? Yes. So, yes, yeah, so I'm going to. Okay. Uh, thank you. I, I will keep my questions very short. Uh, to Satanga, thank you for the presentation. Um, as you mentioned also, in, in Ethiopia, we have a uh, liberal abortion law, but uh, conscious, conscientious objection is not regulated. So it's being used, especially lately, uh, to restrict more uh, that liberalized um, policy on abortion services. So uh, I was wondering if you can reflect a bit on what human rights law can offer in terms of compelling countries to regulate, because non-regulation is becoming a way to restrict abortion services in actual terms. Thank you. Do we? Okay, hello. So it's more of a comment uh, and an invitation for all of us to think further and to complicate further this issue. Um, are we assuming that the reproductive uh, needs are tied only to biological uh, and physical needs? So I'm trying to, to look at the thing in the intersection with gender identity. For example, if we have like a trans man who is not fully transitioned medically, they will be still having biological needs. So, so yes, uh, I, I just want to look further more than, yeah, to, to, to tie the reproductive health needs with only cis women identified people. Thank you. <laughs> I think the only conclusion must be people want coffee. But, but this was amazing. This was absolutely amazing. And I think it's it's clear that we'll continue this discussion, of course, today, but also next year. Very, very good. Thank you.